Yes, I was here a year ago at this very same event, and I so appreciate that uh, invitation to come back again. And so thank you to the San Diego School of Christian Studies and the leadership there for, for inviting me to come back in and think through this big question that we're going to have fun thinking through today. And thank you, of course, to the wider um, community. I took that picture uh, last time when I was here. So that's your church one year ago today. Uh, a little different weather that day. And and also, just to everybody who came into the room today, I, I, I'm really inspired by your willingness to enter into these kinds of questions. It's a bit of a niche interest, isn't it? Like public theology. Uh, what are we going to do as folks who are affiliated with the Christian tradition uh, and, and all of the different things that that means? Uh, what's next? Uh, we hear all the doom and gloom about how difficult things are for church communities of all sizes. You know, most Christian churches in the United States have fewer than 30 members. Uh, the vast majority of them, in fact. So giant campuses like this with these robust communities are actually quite rare. Um, I've been living in San Diego since 1985, and I've driven Mission Valley 10,000 times and seen this building up here. And I know from word of mouth all over town, wherever I go, what a big footprint and what influence uh, your community has in the San Diego region and uh, beyond. So it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here, and I'm actually a little intimidated coming into this room with so many thoughtful people who know a great deal more than I do about a great deal. But as a professor, I know that the game is not to come into the room as any kind of expert and to, and, and to have this fantasy that I'm going to tell you all what it's all about. What I am tasked with, whether it's in a college classroom or at Oasis or in the things that I write, is leading inquiries, is, is thinking of good questions that are going to help us all move a couple of steps beyond our fear, beyond our doubt beyond mere speculation into some kind of knowing. And so the idea when I spoke with Kay and a few other leaders here, was it last summer we got on a Zoom and kind of just brainstormed this thing like, what do we need? What are the questions that are coming up in the community? And everywhere I go, I often am a guest minister, a guest speaker, even though I'm not really a minister. I have one of those cards you get from a website that help, that makes it legal for you to do weddings. <laughs> so I signed the San Diego County marriage license with a with a with some imposter syndrome as minister Peter Boland, having never really been a minister or spent one day in seminary. But my my degrees are academic degrees. I have a bachelor's degree in religious studies from UC Santa Barbara and then my master's in philosophy from San Diego State. And I've been teaching in community college classrooms for 33 years now, um, introduction to philosophy, world religions, Asian philosophy, ethics, world mythology, those kinds of classes. School starts in a couple weeks, so I'm getting ready for that. But I bring all that up because I'm sometimes actually a guest minister um, at some churches, and it started with some new thought churches, you know, the Unity Center up off of Miramar Road or Vision, a center for spiritual living over here, the Christian science community. And that's kind of your entry point, right? That's sort of, that's where people who don't know Christianity sometimes start out. Okay, here's a, here's a sort of nominally Christian community that is explicitly universalist, that all religions are true. And you walk in the foyer and there's the Om symbol and the, Tao, the, and, and the yin and yang thing and all that. And there's Buddhas everywhere, that kind of church. And that, that, that was my gateway into Christianity. And then I found myself getting invited to go to Unitarian Universalist churches with all their beautiful, um, progressive political activism, you know, right at the front of the Black Lives Matter parade and with the LGBTQ flags everywhere. And it's just like, oh, wow, this is an interesting community with deep roots to Ralph Waldo Emerson, my favorite uh, American writer, and then uh, more on my journey later, but as I go around and speak and meet with different Christian communities of all flavors, I hear from so many ministers as well that there is a struggle, that membership is aging, membership is shrinking. 
Where are all the young people at? What can we do to evolve our liturgy, our services, the way we communicate? You know, we all, because of COVID, learned how to be online much more effectively, and we all know how to Zoom now, and that was a difficult thing, but a good thing, and, and it broadened a lot of the reach of our community. I'm sure this church has online members in Hong Kong, you know, and so that was kind of a cool thing, but there is a lot of change, and when has history not evolved, not changed? So this image came to my mind of thinking about, you know, there are certain perennial unchanging, universal, immutable truths in the world's religions that don't change, that have nothing to do with demographics and market trends. And yet the ground beneath us keeps shifting. And so that image of old seeds, new ground, where can we look as Christian communities for inroads into folks who probably would really enjoy what we offer, but they just, something's keeping them away. They don't want to set foot in places like this. And I want to think through some of those reasons with you this morning. So I don't have a crystal ball. People sometimes ask me, you know, can you tell us what's next? And of course, <laughs> I'd like to know what's next also. I don't even know what's for lunch. I hear there's lunch. I don't know what we're having, but I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. And, and so that is where I start. And I'm not one of those um, high-dollar church success consultants that go around and talk to ministers and church governing boards and leadership groups and tell them how to improve their marketing and outreach and put butts in the seats, that kind of pedestrian thinking, you know, that, that actually is pretty important. I'm not that guy. But I am convinced that there is great value in shared inquiry and reflection. I'm especially looking forward to our Q&A, our conversation here after I get done with my remarks, because there is a wealth of thought and reflection and experience right here around these tables. So I have a list of questions. That's how I always start. Like, what do I want to know? What do I think some of us want to know? Well, here's something we can think about. How is the American religious landscape changing? Because it is. <laughs> it's changing a lot. And the change is accelerating. And so I, I'm not a sociologist, but I dug into some of the research and literature, and I want to present to you a few, just a few trend points about how the American religious landscape is changing. And that gets us into a question of, like, what do we even mean by the word Christian? It's such, uh, it's, that, that label is stretched so thin. And it can mean so many different things that I know more and more people who are practicing a Christian life who no longer bother announcing it to anyone or they don't want to tell anybody that they're a Christian because they're afraid they'll get associated with those kinds of Christians. <laughs> and the confusion just compounds. So people just kind of keep it to themselves. And it is a private matter. I mean, that's, you know, here in this country, we have freedom of conscience and you get to worship a piece of green cheese if you want to. And it's nobody's business. And, and so in some sense, our ideologies and spiritual practices are private matters. But guess what? We also live in a public sphere. And if we don't speak for Christianity, then guess who does? You know, the loudest people who may not speak for us. More on that to come. Uh, maybe this is a way to think about it. Does Christianity have a brand problem? I guess I was just scratching the surface of that a moment ago. Yes, it does. Let's think about that. What role do moderate Christians have to play in the face of rising Christian extremism, if any? And, you know, I have some points of view about that, but I don't know what the formula is. But so we can think about that. And maybe a broader question, what is, what is religion for in general? It comes, the word religion comes from that Greek word religio, or in Latin, religare, which means to link back, to connect. So in its most general sense, whether it's Buddhism or the Sufi mystics or, 
or, or Vedanta or Hasidic Judaism or any religion you care to name, they all seem to have this in common, shamanistic traditions, indigenous spiritualities around the world. They are always about one thing, fundamentally, bringing individuals out of fragmentation, alienation, loneliness, and confusion, and into reconnection with at least the human community and, and at best with the entire cosmos to integrate us and make us feel comfortable in our own skin and feel like we belong purposefully to the mystery that this is. And so religion serves all people in that way in many different forms, of course. And this is a question that a lot of us in Christianity are wrestling with really all the time. How should we use our guiding scriptures? Literalism and fundamentalism is one perspective. Reading scripture metaphorically is another. And there's a whole gradient scale, a whole range inside of those two particular points. How should we use our mythic images how should we use our rituals and our traditions? And what, what, do we want to, what do we want to do now and who do we want to be now? Those are all big questions, big wonderings that I want to just open up with you for the next bit here and see where this all takes us. So, yes, the changing American religious landscape, that's a... <laughs> I'll tell you a little story. Um... I got an email one day from a producer at KUSI Television. This was last summer. That's me sitting with Jason Ostell on the set of K KUSI on their weekend show. Well, right? I got, to, got, I got to get out my suit. I got to put on a suit because I know how guys on TV dress. I'm like, okay, I'm going to fit in with the tribe of talking heads on TV. And uh, I, went, I went into the studio early, early Sunday morning. And the reason they invited me and reached out to me was like, uh, well, we need a religious studies professor because there's this news story about a new Gallup poll that had just come out. And Gallup poll and, and the Gallup polling organization has been polling Americans since, I don't know, the 40s uh, about all kinds of things. And this question was uh, belief in God. Do you believe in God? And the, 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 the headline that they wanted me to come in to talk about was that belief in God had sunk to below 81%, it, down from 87% in 2017. That's a big dip in a pretty short amount of time, especially since it, between 19, uh, 1944 and 2011, it hovered around 90%. So for it to dip below 81%, um, caused some concern, especially in some circles. And as you probably know, K KUSI has a fairly conservative um, editorial lean, and their viewers tend to be more traditional Christian folks. And so this was viewed. This bit of news was 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 viewed with certain consternation and and uh, worry. And so Jason Ostell um, asked me. What do you think the reason is that that lesson that fewer and fewer people believe in God? And I knew I was on TV, and I knew this entire block was about three minutes long. And I'm used to talking for 90 minutes. Fitting it into 60 is a Herculean task. So three minutes, I'm like, and, and as a philosophy professor, my first instinct was to say, I don't know. That's pretty lousy TV, and I, why did I put on a suit to go in front of the cameras and say, I don't know, I don't know. what do you think, Jason? Uh, so I, I, I sort of mumbled a few things, and then, of course, like a good politician, I pivoted. You know, I said, that's a really interesting question, but what I find fascinating, and where I, where I led it immediately, well, you can look it up on YouTube if you want to see it. It's on my YouTube channel. It's not really worth looking up, but, but what I pivoted to was this question. What, what about church attendance? A church attendance is collapsing faster than this. And to me, like I shared with you a moment ago, that's the fear that I hear from so many of my minister, rabbi, and imam friends. Like, where is everybody? And then COVID came along, and, you know, and now it's tough to get people back and so on. And so what I immediately 
admitted to him was that, well, it's really difficult to find a cause. And if you do look up the video, you'll see him trot out a few theories, which are good. He said, well, he said, I think it's like people just have so many technological distractions lately. Even when you go to fire up your big screen TV to pull up the church service tomorrow morning on YouTube, right along the bottom is Apple TV and Disney and everything else. And you're like, on YouTube, maybe I'll just watch pickleball videos instead of going to church. Uh, or maybe I'll watch that really big Methodist church in New York City that I really like or whatever. So it's, you know, it's tough, it, it, the competition and the technological distractions. Maybe that's true. And then he brought up, you know, the loss of traditions and, and the way the nuclear family is kind of scattering. And he kind of referenced this kind of 1950s sort of model of, of, of the family all getting dressed up on Sunday morning and marching off to church. And, and I understand that nostalgia and that, and that energy. Um, but I, I really wanted to think less about why fewer people say yes to believing in God, because to me that's not so statistically significant. It's similar enough. The collapse in affiliation and membership is much deeper. So on this question of church attendance, in 2020, 47% of Americans belong to a church or a synagogue. About half. And it was 73% in 1937 when Gallup began the poll, a decline of, of 26%. That's a big change in church attendance and membership. I'm combining those things together here. So this decline correlates closely with the number of Americans who, when asked what religion they are, check the box that says none of the above. So in my business, in religious studies, we call them nuns. It's kind of confusing. Or we call them SBNRs. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious? And they make this very stark distinction. Those of us who are both understand the reason for that distinction, but for us, there's more overlap than difference between spiritual and religious, but for people who have stepped away from religion but still consider themselves spiritual, there is a significant difference in their minds. And so we're going to talk a little bit about SBNRs because they have left traditional religious institutions like this one and like the one that I go to, and they are out there doing it DIY, doing it on their own, putting together a spiritual life in from a multitude of sources. So let's think of, for a few minutes about spiritual and not religious folks. Can I just call them SBNRs? Because we don't have all day. Okay. Um, so among SBNRs, belief in God is the norm, 70%. Does that number sound familiar from the last slide? You know, it's not that different from religious folks. Or I should say that more accurately. It's not that different from the general population. 70% of SBNRs believe in God when, when you ask them. But it's kind of the same thing that happens to me when I'm on a plane and I'm going somewhere and you, know, you talk to a stranger. So what do you do for a living? I tell them what I do. And, they, and sometimes they say, oh, you teach religion, huh? Yeah. Do you believe in God? And I'm like, oh, this is a long flight. I don't know if... Um, because as a philosophy professor, you know what I did. I said, what do you mean by God? You know, what are you, what are you asking me to like thumbs up, thumbs down? You know, and, and then the conversation gets good. Because now we start talking about our different understandings of divinity and ultimate reality. And that's in fact what SBNRs are kind of known for. They say they believe in God, but they use the God word as a placeholder denoting the spiritual energy of being itself present everywhere, even within us. A kind of, again, for any budding theologians in the room, a kind of pantheism or panentheism. Not a belief in a God who is someone somewhere. A personified entity that created the universe from outside of it. But they use the God word as the name of the life force itself, what's, what George Lucas in the Star Wars films calls the force. SBNRs are the fastest growing segment in religious demographics. 
SBNRs, ha as a rule, have left their faith family of origin. They may have been born Catholic or Jewish or whatever, and they are no longer involved in that community. They are out now, free form, in a different way. But they're open to spiritual experience through non-traditional means, nature, travel, art, personal exploration, study, reading, different spiritual traditions. SBNRs are not so good at affiliation, but they are terribly active in what you and I would recognize as spiritual pursuits. So S, S, SBNRs also, to put a single word on it, tend to be universalists. They argue that all religions are true. Some of you know who Richard Rohr is. He's a Franciscan friar, a Roman Catholic priest running uh, a center out of Albuquerque, New Mexico called the Center for Action and Contemplation. As a lifelong priest and Roman Catholic, I think he's an SBNR too because he is a universalist, right? His last book was called The Universal Christ. And he's explicit every day in his newsletter that you know Christianity is a practice that does not exclude any of the other religions. Now, I don't know if that's how all Catholics think. I know it isn't. Or Methodists or fill in your denomination here. So there are different ways even to be Catholic, as Richard Rohr demonstrates. So that's an SBNR stance. That truth, whatever it is, is bigger than any specific religious ideology. I heard a friend of mine putting it this way, Christianity is the plate I eat off of, but it's not the food. I, actually, I said that. I, just, <laughs> I wanted to test drive it first. Now I, I got some ooze, so yeah, actually, I said that. I was just describing that to somebody else. You know, religion for me is a menu. It's a map, and it's not the place. I'm not here to confess what my views are, but I think that's sort of a useful way that you find that kind of thinking often in the SBNR circles. So there tends to be a lot of respect for all religious paths. SBNRs blend a number of elements drawn from the world's spiritual tradition. Sure, they're going to um, pull pieces from all the different traditions, and that drives other more traditional Christians crazy, like, you can't do that. I've heard my more conservative Catholic friends talk with great derision about cafeteria Catholics. Cafeteria Catholics. They go down the line, they take the pieces they want, and then they vote for pro-choice political candidates. They wish there were LGBTQ marriages in Catholic churches and so on. And they're like, you can't do that. It's all or nothing. And so the SBNRs go much further than that. They're, they're picking pieces from all the traditions and putting them into a personal practice. SBNRs or nuns are looking for meaningful spiritual experiences and communities. And I'm going to eventually work up here this morning to suggesting that, that, that old, traditional, rev revered, Sects like Methodism, like Episcopalianism, which is my tradition, like Catholicism, have great opportunities in attracting SBNRs to their communities because these people long for community. I read an article yesterday about the rapid growth in atheist churches. Yes. Atheist churches, did you see that? So they do everything we do in our churches, but there's no talk of what they call the supernatural. But they take care of each other. They build outreach. They sing. They have meditations. And everybody in the room is free to not believe in God. And in my experience, when I sit and talk with atheists, most of them are actually agnostics. Atheism is a particularly fierce and rigid metaphysical stance that I don't find too many. They're there, but most folks just really kind of land in an agnostic place where it's just like, well, it's all a mystery and I don't really know what everybody's talking about, which is different than the outright explicit denial that there is a God. 
And SBNRs often hold these views in private while attending traditional churches, synagogues, and mosques. They're right here with us now. They're sitting on your table. <laughs> Look to the left and right. There might be an SBNR near you. Um, and, and because why not? Why not take advantage of these incredible communities filled with beautiful people trying to live better lives, trying to do good in the world, trying to practice a little self-discipline about their worst impulses. Why wouldn't you want to surround yourself with people like that who try anyway to put love first? Why rob yourself of that, of that fellowship? So SBNRs are an interesting segment of the American religious landscape. And this is something I want to think about briefly with you, too, that maybe some of us in, who are members of more traditional church communities could, could be more vocal about, acknowledging religious trauma. And what I mean by that is I, again, as a community college professor, uh, in two weeks when I meet my students, the, our first discussion is going to be uh, called, you know, describe your relationship with religion. And outpour all the stories of exclusion, judgment, and trauma alongside more benign but still troubling accounts of cultural and familial conformity to group norms, often using fear as a tool of coercion, fear of God and or fear of loss of family love. And so my LGBT students, especially my trans students, almost to a person, have been kicked out of their family, have been told that God hates them. And for the rest of their lives, just to see a Christian cross hanging around your neck at the grocery store re-traumatizes them. How much separation between God's children and God is perpetrated by the godly. And that's a question for us just to sort of sit with, you know, that old, what would Jesus do? And so I'm struck by that. And then, you know, nearly all of my 19 to 25 year old college students have fallen away from their faith families of origin and their original practices. Most of them are going to make it back, usually with the birth of the first child and you go to get them christened and so on. And all of a sudden you're back in church. But that happens later in life. And a lot of us in church wonder, where are all the 20 and 30-year-olds? Why does everybody, you know, 55 and older? And not everybody, but you are talking about trends here, right? And so what if we could do better to acknowledge that the very traditions that we grew up with, maybe some of us, those of us with happier religious experiences are vulnerable to underestimating the way our familiar Christian rituals, traditions, and ideas trigger pain in others. I mean, none of this is our fault. Don't, don't hear this as, you know, oh, I did something wrong and I have to atone for it. No, it's about how do we message better? How do we reach out better? Uh, I can promise you this is a major factor keeping people out of buildings like this. And for us to be silent about it forever is a problem. It's a, it's, a, it's a communication problem. So um, that's what leads me to putting it this way, that Christianity, it seems to me, has a brand problem. Let's think about this a little bit. And I want to do this carefully because I know there's all kinds of diverse points of view in this room. And I have my perspectives and others have theirs. And so this isn't me lecturing anybody about politics. But as I look at the landscape of, of our society... I notice a few things that have changed in the last few years. There are many ways of being Christian, of course. We all acknowledge that, and we all acknowledge that from diversity comes strength. But it is also, case, it is also the case that the loudest voices in our public discourse are usually the most extreme voices who claim to speak for all Christians. In... <laughs> and speak for God, yeah. So in the minds of many, that word Christianity is associated with, for example, Christian nationalism. And if you're not 
familiar with that term. Christian nationalism is a kind of catch-all term for a particular stance uh, that is openly exclusionary, openly theocratic. They want America to be a Christian nation. They believe the Constitution was a divinely inspired document like the Bible and that we should teach Christianity as the American religion. They read the founding documents differently than a lot of us do where Thomas Jefferson and Madison and others were adamant about keeping what they called derisively the churchmen out of government. And, and having been stung by the Church of England's marriage with the monarchy, they wanted to create a nation where the people who ran churches had nothing to do with the people who ran the government. And that's how most of us grew up learning about American history. Well, not these folks. They feel that is a misreading, and so they want a theocracy. Um, they are openly authoritarian, and that goes together with anti-democratic. They are openly bigoted toward other faith traditions. And of course, at its worst, and this gets over into the shadows of white supremacy, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and all the rest. So that rising clamor is often the first thing many SBNRs think about when they think about Christianity. And why would I want to go anywhere near that, they think. So that's a communication problem for the more moderate among us. So in their own words, in fact, Christian nationalists are increasingly willing to embrace violence as a legitimate means of furthering their own agenda. If, if, if elections are are fixed and rigged, then it is okay to violently seek to overthrow the results of those. This is openly favored now in polling among people who define themselves this way. Um, here's another piece. When Roe v. Wade, the law since 1973, was overturned a year and a half ago, on my birthday, June 24th, 2022, um, well, you see what's happened since then. That in many states, abortion is now unavailable. That in the most extreme places, there is no allowance for abortion under any circumstances. And I just spoke to a Catholic friend of mine yesterday, a married woman who said, if I was raped, I would carry that baby because that is God's child. And so that's the point of view in that sort of Christian nationalist sense that forces 12-year-old girls repeatedly raped by their stepfathers to carry that birth to term. So beyond pro-life, people who are in favor of abortion access call that forced birth. So what is the Christian community writ large to do about this terribly vexing philosophical, metaphysical, political, medical, human rights problem? And there's no consensus, obviously. We're struggling with this. A lot of us are struggling with it in here. And we aren't here today to sort that out, but this is another giant brand problem for Christianity, that people who favor rational, conditional abortion access have been put against their will into a fight against Christianity. And many of them are Christians. And maybe someday I'll do a talk on the politics of abortion here. That would be fun. I do it at Oasis. But the data is clear. Christians in America, by a pretty sizable majority, favor legal abortion access. Our tradition, Christianity, favors liberty and autonomy. And if a woman is pregnant, as our Jewish friends claim, that tissue is part of the woman's body. And the woman does not abdicate her bodily autonomy at conception. Can a Christian hold that view? Of course, they do all the time, and most Christians do. 
And yet people find themselves struggling against those who claim to speak for all Christians. I love what Episcopalian Bishop John uh, Shelby Spong said in one of his books. He said, Christianity is like the community pool. All of the noise is coming from the shallow end. (laughs) That's pretty good. So I like that, but I also wonder, why is the deep end so quiet? And what would us speaking up look like? This is not an easy thing to figure out. So how should we respond? You know, as Bishop Desmond Tutu reminds us, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So Desmond Tutu kicks the stool out from the concept of neutrality. Plato said this 25 centuries ago in the Republic. Silence is complicity. When you are silent, you are tacitly saying, whatever is going on right now, I'm okay with it. I support it. And people like Desmond Tutu fighting apartheid in South Africa, the minority rule of the white over the majority African community. um, Silence just causes too much suffering. Our silence is perceived as complicity by SBNRs, nuns, and the Christian curious who sometimes think of entering our doors. The Christian curious. There are a lot of people who are Christian curious, who have, who feel themselves drawn into these rooms, into these traditions, but for some of the reasons we've been go- thinking about today, they won't set foot in places like this. What a lost opportunity for us. Is it time to speak truth more plainly from the pulpit to the parking lot? And as I've gotten to know your community, I know that's exactly what you are doing here. And I love that. I love the the growth and, and, and it doesn't come without a cost. We all know about the worldwide schism in Methodism around sanctifying same-sex marriages predominantly. And the same thing happened in my community too, in the Episcopalian community, (laughs) just when they allowed women to be priests in the 70s. That was a huge schism, let alone same-sex unions. So religious communities are usually about 40 years behind the, the larger society, but they always sort of get there eventually. And so we look to the, to the South African model, truth and reconciliation. You know, the way that they made peace in South Africa was not just jumping right to reconciliation. Oh, okay, let's all us white and black people, let's just get along together now and pretend nothing happened. But that's not what they did. They brought in white jailers and, and police officers and soldiers and, and torturers of African Americans, excuse me, of Africans, of South African, black South Africans. And they got in a courtroom and they, and they made that white torturer sit there as a whole line of people he had tortured got on the microphone and looked him in the eye and explain to him what his actions had cost them, and he had to listen to it and take it. But what he got in trade was criminal immunity from prosecution. Some guys didn't take the deal. They just went to jail. But many did. And that idea of, are you willing to hear the truth for a while? And when we say that, there's a kind of healing, and then we can get to reconciliation. Confronting our complicity as as Christian communities, as churches like the Methodist Church, like the Episcopalian Church, like the Baptist Church, all these denominations confronting our complicity in current systems of oppression and admitting our complicity in past wrongs. I was so thrilled to see on Facebook yesterday, the Facebook page of your church, that there is a summer pilgrimage planned to go back east with your reverend, your senior minister, and others, and visit places where the slave trade happened and where the Underground Railroad happened and just get on the ground 
in the truth of America's most damning original sin, human enslavement. And to not just read a couple books and talk about it, but to literally get on a plane and go there and walk those places. This is powerful. I was really inspired by that. I'm going to steal that idea. Okay, to the south, right, got it. Well, that is an incredibly healing and important activity, I would say. Now, um, I just want to mention a, a little bit. I know that as an academic, you know, anecdote is not evidence. But I also know that in the Christian tradition, we put a lot of stock in, in testimony. So I'll, I'll, I'll share a few things here about my own journey. I was baptized into the Christian church at St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral up there in Bankers Hill on Saturday, March 27, 2021, during Holy Week on Easter Eve. So pretty recently, I'm 65 years old, so I guess I was 63 when that happened, something like that. And it took me a long time to get there. I'm still sort of surprised myself that I did that because I come from a very secular kind of wandering sort of tradition. My, my childhood home wasn't religious. My mom and dad were from the, from the Netherlands and um, weren't religious. And I never went to church as a kid. And I grew up falling in love with world religions in college and began studying them all. And then I, I took to the whole thing like a fish to water. But I grew up far outside the Christian tradition, but a life of study and then teaching of all these wisdom traditions kind of brought me to this place where, well, I'm interested in Christianity, but I can't go to a place that teaches scriptural literalism and exclusivity. I can't go to a church that says, our church is the only way. I just, that, that door was forever closed to me because I've seen too much. And I also, it was impossible for me to be uh, in a community of fun, fundamentalists or people who read scripture literally. I'd read too much Joseph Campbell. It was, it was over. It was over. And yet, I love religious I imagery, the power of mythic images, the power of metaphors. When I take communion every Sunday, and the music, and the cross... And reciting the Nicene Creed together. And we don't just recite it, we sing it. And the room is filled with incense, you can hardly breathe. <laughs> and the light coming in through the stained glass. And it just throws me out of all domestic associations. I enter into a kind of mystical space that is beyond theology, beyond doctrine, beyond belief. It is an experience, not an idea. And that became so powerful that I had to be a book that I had to become a part of it. Even though I bet a lot of people up and down the rows where I sit have some different views than I do <laughs> about things. But that's okay, you know. That I'm gonna call that Christian agnosticism. Um, and I know there's some of you here. Don't tell anybody. Because we've heard that our whole life, right? To be a Christian, you have to be a believer. We've had that driven into us, that belief was the most important thing. And that you had to forsake all other traditions and even put energy into converting those folks to yours. I met a woman yesterday whose uh, son-in-law had got involved in a very uh, conservative fundamentalist church in his 20s and even went to the Middle East and put a lot of energy into converting Muslims to Christianity. And then after a few years of doing that, he came back and his faith all fell apart and he's not a part of that community at all anymore. And, the, and, and now he looks back with a certain amount of embarrassment, like how arrogant could I be? <laughs> to go to another person's country, culture, community, and religion and tell them, hey, uh, the religion y'all are in, it's not the real one. I got it right here in my bag. I saw a guy at Balboa Park last Sunday set up a whole booth devoted to converting Muslims to Christianity. He was ready to throw down Quran passage versus Bible passage. So to me, that form of Christian evangelism felt really colonial 
imperialistic and aggressive. And it reeked of a kind of ideological arrogance that just didn't resonate with me at all. So in, but in my growing affinity with Christianity, I was simply adding it to the long list of other traditions, practices, insights that I would loved and been shaped by for so long, Taoism, Buddhism, and all the rest. So I don't know if that's how other people come to Christianity, but for me, Christianity didn't replace any of those other things. And I remain, and this is just me, I'm not preaching this, I just want to confess this so that the one other person who, in the room who agrees with me feels not so alone. I call myself a Christian, I participate in Christian uh, practice, but I'm agnostic about all the supernatural claims. I don't know if Jesus was divine any more than the rest of us are. I don't know if the virgin birth story is literally true. I don't know if he rose from the grave or if that's a potent mythic, mythic image about resurrection. I just don't know. I'm not arguing with any about it, anybody about any of it. I don't want to talk anybody out of their understandings of those things. I just want to share with you that this mythic imagery is for me profoundly potent as metaphor, as transformative metaphor. And again, this puts me at odds with others. I know folks who grew up in the Episcopalian tradition, right? Cradle Episcopalians, we call them. They're sitting right next to me. I'm the guy from 2021. And so I don't tell them what's what, of course. Why would I do that? But I needed a community that not only allowed this agnostic stance, but explicitly defended it. You, you hear what I'm doing with this testimony. I'm wondering with you, what if our messaging here reached out to those nuns, to those SBNRs, with this idea that you don't have to sign a creedal belief contract to walk in here? We are a community of people who walk a path. And again, from Richard Rohr, you know, we get this, this contrast between orthodoxy and orthopraxy. So I just want to rattle off some, some authors that were a big part of this, of this journey that I was on and that a lot of people are on. I'm talking about uh, Rachel Held Evans, Brian McLaren, John Shelby Spong, Nadia Bowles Weber. She's the Lutheran minister with all the tattoos that drops F-bombs <laughs> from the pulpit. She's awesome. And uh, Richard Rohr, who I mentioned, Thomas Merton. I mean, that guy is more responsible than anybody for how I ended up calling myself a Christian. And many, many others, those first few, Rachel Held Evans and Brian McLaren, would refer to themselves as ex-evangelicals. They, they grew up in, in, in the Bible Belt, believing in, an, in a very literal way. They were creationists. You know, all of the teachings of their fundamentalist Protestant churches, you know, that, that uh, against abortion, against women in the priesthood, et cetera. It's very traditional views. Um, both of those writers, Rachel Held Evans and, and Brian McLaren, walked away from that. Ironically, they both ended up as Episcopalians. But so they're still committed to that Jesus path, but with a very different set of, of constructs around them. So there's some interesting reading. And from Richard Rohr, we get this, this uh, distinction between orthodoxy, which is having the right beliefs or the right views, and orthopraxy, which is right action, right practice. So orthodoxy, here the emphasis is on swearing fealty to, a specific doc, to specific doctrinal claims and scriptural interpretations. Rachel Held Evans describes this about her own Baptist upbringing, that to be a member of the Baptist church, they gave you this little piece of paper, and you had to check all of these boxes. I believe this, I believe that, I believe this, I believe it was all about having the right beliefs. And Richard Rohr offers a different perspective that maybe Christianity, it is more important to begin emphasizing that second word. Here, the emphasis is on who you are, how you show up in the world, your embodiment of the teachings. And so to put it this way, don't tell me what you believe, you know, show me who you are. 
Because haven't we all had it up to here? That's what I hear from my students all the time. The reason they just can't go to church anymore. Here's why. The hypocrisy. That's your favorite word when you're a teenager, right? You figure out that all adults say one thing and do another. That's you're like, I cracked the code of adulthood. They're all phony. All those people in church who preach purity and they're out having affairs with each other. And, you know, and, and then you think, well, the whole thing's fake. Instead of baking into the message our, inf- our, our, our fallibility. And this idea, I think I see taking hold among SBNRs more and more, that religion is not a tribal affiliation. It's not an identity. It is an open-ended call to do better and to be better. What if we began to preach Christianity more that way? Not as it's an identity, you come in, we brand you Christian, but instead... Why don't we just say, well, I'm on, the, I'm on the path, you know. I'm a follower of the Christian path. So th- what if these are the qualities of a spiritual community that truly welcomes SBNRs and nuns, a community based more on how we live and less on what we believe? And that's a kind of agnostic piece then. So let me just... Uh, pull together the last few pieces here. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a minister in uh, Austin, Texas that I found on Facebook re- recently, a Presbyterian minister called Jim Rigby. I'll just share some things he wrote recently. When people ask if I'm a Christian, I have to ask them what kind of Christian they have in mind. If by Christian you mean someone who deems Christianity as superior to other worldviews, If by Christian you mean someone who fights against scientific discovery in the name of biblical inerrancy, if by Christian you mean the kind of religion that focuses on getting into a hypothetical heaven while planet Earth goes to hell, then the answer is no. If that is your definition of Christianity, I want no part of it. But if by Christian they mean a fervent love song that can be sung in harmony with my neighbors from other worldviews, If by Christian they mean a religion that calls us to build a fairer world where the poor, the weak, and the outcast are lifted into full inclusion. If by Christian they mean one culture's version of the universal hymn to love, then the answer is yes. Because whatever label is given to it, my highest aspiration is to grow into the kind of universal love exemplified by Jesus and all of the other best friends of humankind. I wasn't aware that Presbyterian ministers talked like that. Yeah. He, he might be in trouble with his tribe a little bit, but he's leading a church in Austin. That's the weird part of Texas, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and by the way, let me uh, skip past this one, uh, but it's that, it's, that, it's, a, it's that idea of agnosticism. Is it that we're all really agnostic in a sense because we all are humble enough to know we don't understand the whole mystery. So is it, does Christianity require doctrinal certainty? And that's the question we don't have to answer, but it's an interesting question to sit with. Can you be a Christian and not know? Because I don't know, I just never, as an outsider for most of my life, I never got that message. I thought Christianity was always about conforming to a set of beliefs and claiming to know that those were the truth. I was shocked to realize that there were lots of people in the Christian family who were agnostic about some of those views. So what's next for the church? You know, maybe as a community of learners and not passive believers, maybe as a community that leads people away from answers and toward experiences. I feel like that's what's going on here in a lot of ways. The sort of mystical communal experiences that draw the sacred up through our own life. And if we really trusted God by all of their names, by all of its names, then maybe just getting out of the way and making openings and cutting channels, you know, that we're not transmitters of the truth, but facilitators of experiences in which truth 
of the sacred can well up on its own. And these trends come and go. But maybe there's great hope. Um, and I'm going to skip this part. But there's a wonderful story in chapter 13 that, that where Jesus says to his students, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I have tended. And it's a sort of slap, really, against some of his disciples for worshiping him too much instead of the truth that he represents. And so have we become intoxicated by religiosity, by us versus them, by the need to define that idea in the Gospel of Thomas as Jesus as not the source, but the facilitator? And are we not also called to be the gardeners and the groundskeepers and the tenders of the spring? Uh, the garden doesn't grow because of us, but we create the conditions in which the garden can thrive. You can see I'm really riding that old seeds, new ground metaphor into the ground here. But it's, it is getting towards spring, and some of us are thinking about the earth coming back to life and trusting that the garden will grow best with minimal, with, with minimal interference. And it is our role, maybe, just to cut away the dead wood and clear the channels and prepare the soil and work and plant and prune and discern and nurture and move into deeper accord with what is already unfolding. I Just a couple final quotes. Uh, this one popped into my mind. Um, President Bill Clinton at his first inaugural address, I, I, I still remember this like it was yesterday. There's nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. And I think of that in terms of Christianity. There's nothing wrong with Christianity that can't be cured by what is right with Christianity. Or the church. There's nothing wrong with the church that can't be cured by what is right with the church. And Christian mystic Meister Eckhart put it this way, that God is not found by a process of addition, but by a process of subtraction. What could we let go of? Thinking about removing impediments. What's keeping people out of the doors? It's not that we have to, like, hey, let's have more rock and roll in the service. Or, you know, we'll have tattooed ministers or something, or bigger PAs. Um, maybe it's about removing impediments instead of adding enhancements. And maybe the last, maybe we could let go of the last vestiges of our doctrinal rigidity, our scriptural literalism, the old emphasis on orthodoxy over orthopraxy. We could let go of our silent complicity with systems of oppression. We could let go of our silence about the way our institution benefited from past structures of oppression. I know in my formation classes at St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral, I learned explicitly about the role of the English church, the Anglican church, in the colonial enslavement of England, of so much of the rest of the world. The church just says, hey, we did that just as Methodist ministers in the South argued for the righteousness of slavery and quoted biblical scripture. You know, why don't we just put that on the sign out on Interstate 8? Um, there's still a lot of shame around all of this. And that silence, again, sends a message, doesn't it? So any remaining reluctance to celebrate the way God is revealed through all of the world's religions and kind of trading in any remaining whiffs of exclusivity, exclusion, or arrogance for this deep and welcoming humility. And that is, I think, where we kind of end up now with this beautiful Sufi poem of Hafiz, uh, all the way back in the 14th century, a, a Muslim who wrote the mystical manifesto. I have learned so much from God that I can no longer call myself a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Jew. The truth has revealed so much of of itself with me that I can no longer call myself a man, a woman, an angel, or even a pure soul. Love has befriended Hafiz so completely. It has turned to ash and freed me of every concept and image. So I will close there. And now I'm eager to hear any questions and comments that you have in whatever way we were going to do that. So thank you. Thank you kindly.
Thank you so much, Peter. Please um, prepare to hand in your note cards to Limby, who's right over here. She'll collect those cards for anyone who would like to donate to us. We'll have the passing of the hat while we're answering questions. And thank you so very much. We'll start with questions as soon as we have all our cards. If you think of another question while we're doing cards, um, you can always hand them in to, to Lindy. Just bring them up. Is somebody, uh, is one person going to read the question? Lindy is. Yeah, she's going to cut it. Okay. I love the cat in the hat technique. <laughs> we did. We, we were adamant that we would not have used collection plates. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's oh, here's an easy one to start with. Okay. <laughs> the Trinity seems to be a doctrinal certainty of Christianity. How does the path you are on live with the Trinity? Oh, that's very. Very rich question. So the Trinity to me is a really beautiful um, idea. And for me personally, since the question sort of is shaped that way, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the Hindu tradition. And if you think three forms of God is a lot, you know, check out Hinduism. And so I have no problem with the idea that in the Christian tradition, ultimate reality, which is beyond all concepts, beyond all ideas, beyond all terms, can be conceptualized as three moments that are also simultaneously claimed to be one moment. And that, uh, to me, is, is I, I don't wrestle with that at all, really. I think that's a, that's a beautiful way of thinking about the divine in those three senses as a panentheistic, superior, force that gave birth to all of this as the Father, but then the Holy Spirit is the imminence of God, the presence of God within all things, including all of us. That's that namaste idea you get in your yoga class. And then the idea of God incarnating as a human being is a, a, a very constant theme in Hinduism. The Sanskrit word is avatar. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is an incarnation of God, and so is Rama and many, many others. So to me, that's a really powerful way of ensuring in your religious teaching that you put God's presence right here, right now, in the messiness of the very world that you and I are trying to navigate. So I think it's a beautiful way to, to think about God, the Trinity. That's my sense of it. It feels a little bit like a job interview. <laughs> I like it. I got I like another it. one for yeah, you. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> How do you reconcile remaining agnostic regarding the supernatural elements of faith with your recitation of the Nicene Creed? Oh, that's, I struggle every Sunday with that, yeah. <laughs> You know, here's how, here's how we do it, and I say we because me and some other Episcopalians talk about this a lot. I, re I, I recognize the Nicene Creed as a hugely important moment in the development of Christianity. A lot of you know that the Nicene Creed was crafted uh, by the Emperor Constantine who drew together at Nicaea in 325 this, this council of all the Christian leaders from all over the Mediterranean. And in that classic Roman way, they thought, we have to bring law and order <laughs> to the messiness of all this faith diversity. There were all kinds of Christianity, Christianities, and the Roman skill par excellence was, was how to build empire, bureaucracy, and law. And it's like, let's bring that energy to the messy business of spirituality. So to me, the Nicene Creed is just an example of a bunch of lawyers getting around a table and like writing a contract of like, here's the list of what our official beliefs are. But unfortunately, it also became a centralization of power because those in leadership in the church at that time immediately began to use the Nicene Creed to exclude all dissent. They called them heretics. They forced them to convert. And if they didn't, they were often killed. And so that's a shadow 
in any institution when everybody is being asked to conform. So I have a lot of mixed feelings about it, but I read it, I, I recite it along with everyone else in, in as open-minded way as possible as a historically, profoundly significant moment. And in my own personal agnosticism, um, I just kind of let it, let it go by. And, and stay open, that's important. I don't dismiss it from some position of arrogance. Like, well, I know better, but I'll just sing along. It isn't that at all. I'm absolutely open to the depth of the experience of the people who crafted this and the depth of the experience of the people around me who are singing it. I know I'm not getting everything. I know I have still much more to learn and much more will be revealed. So I try to stay in that, in the question. Can our Christian church congregation be meaningful and helpful to others if our public statements, clergy and laity both, don't take positions on political or social issues? No. <laughs> no, I just, I just, it just felt good to say that. I don't know if that's, it's not as simple as that, is it? Because uh, we, are per, we are forbidden as a 501c3, is that what it is? Our tax exempt status requires legally that we cannot back candidates. Although lots of ministers all over the country do that, especially right where you think they are, right? Um, but the good ones know that that's a line you shouldn't cross. And however, if you can't talk about values and reducing harm and feeding the needs of the community, then what are we even doing being a religious community, right? That's clearly the mission of Christianity and every faith family. And that is going to bump you up against certain political uh, challenges, like let's just talk about the border, right, and immigration. Um, do we open our churches for undocumented people? Uh, and, and do we keep ICE out? Well, then you're right, gonna, you're right away going to get in trouble with, with the government, and that's always been a challenge, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. You know, Jesus discovered that right away in the early years of his work, that this is a live question for us, you know, as, as an organized society with government, taxes, and when the state has power, and the power of the police, the power to imprison, um, those are very, very serious structures and there is a time and a place for all of that. But um, I think minister, I just go back to all of our heroes. You know, how did, how did Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King do it? You know, he went to jail 47 times in his life. That's how he did it. You know, you fill the jails. This is how we're going to fight an oppressive system, by sacrificing ourselves. Not by attacking anybody, but just offering up ourselves and filling the jails and making sure it all gets documented and changing the conscience. You know, the, as, as Dr. King wrote in his very much, I don't know, it's just required reading, isn't it? I go back to it every few months and read it again. His letter from a Birmingham jail, which is scripture to me. And for Dr. King, the biggest problem was not the Ku Klux Klan. It was white moderates who were silent and did nothing. I, we just don't hear that message enough. And I just defer to him. And in, in a lot of our anti-racism work, you know, my, my African-American and black friends tell me, you know, this is white people's work to do. And, and I, I very much agree with that. So I think all of us in, all of those in leadership in, in Christian communities are, are exploring ways to get more um, assertive and practice the virtues we say we believe. Okay, with respect to SBNRs, is urbanization related, less neighbor pressure to participate in traditional religion? And could the decline in church attendance be centered around millennia, millennia, yeah. you, know, you know what I'm trying to say, yeah. Gen X's and Gen Z's? Yes, I'm yes. I'm completely... Uh, yeah, young kids. Yeah. Yeah. Young kids, yeah. Yeah, people in our, <laughs> our age, yeah. yeah. Wanting to know, what is church going to do for me? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair question. You know, that's the sense in which... Um, let me see if I can answer it this way. I'm giving a talk, a talk on Wednesday at San Diego Oasis 
on Karl Marx. I'm doing a series there called The Great Philosophers, and it's Karl Marx's turn. And so as you may know, he's one of the most uh, infamous and notorious philosophers around here. So for some of our politicians, the words Marx and Marxism are dirty words. So I thought it was time to kind of think about what he actually wrote and taught. But I bring that up because Marx made a really interesting point that he called them the substructures and the superstructures. And if I could lay a little Marxist theory on you here for a second. Marx's position was that our religions, you know, our ideologies, our morals, our beliefs, that what he called the superstructure, doesn't come down and control the material conditions of our lives, the substructure. He says it's the other way around. Our, you know, who has all the money? Who controls real estate? Who controls the resources? Who controls banking? Who has a a access to energy? Who has access to health care? Those are the fundamental substructures that give rise to the superstructures are of our ideology. And that question reminds me of, of a really important inquiry, and that is the substructure keeps changing the urbanization piece. You know, we don't live in these Norman Rockwell rural villages where we all where, where we all live in three generational homes and then walk to our beautiful little Methodist church in the village square. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We're scattered. We live, a lot of us, alone. We live on our screens. So this is the structure of our society. And it's no doubt impacted the way we even conceive of church attendance, church membership, let alone the way we align our own spiritual practice with those traditions. So this is a question that is important to be asked, but it cannot be answered because we're in it right now. And we're inventing this next iteration of ourselves right now. We're trying to figure out how to use technology to enhance our humanity. (laughs) Because right now it seems like technology has taken over and cost us our humanity. And so is technology going to serve humanity or is humanity going to serve technology? And that is what we're trying to navigate right now. And that's going to have a huge impact on what we mean by religious community. Do you have an elevator speech that you can use when someone asks you why you're a Christian? Oh, that's good. Elevator speech, you know what that is, right? That means you got 20 seconds. You're in an elevator with somebody. You're in an elevator with Steven Spielberg, and you got a movie idea. You got 20 seconds. That's an elevator pitch. So sure, somebody, you know, people ask me all the time, it'll come up on the first day of school. Professor Boland, what religion are you? And I'm happy to talk about that and about my own journey and hopefully not have it be 20 minutes long, but 20 seconds long. So for me, um, I'm already way over 20 seconds. Huh? Let, me, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me try and do the elevator speech. Um, I don't have a stopwatch with me, but I've, I am in love with all of the world's wisdom traditions. I respect them all. I've built a career and a personal life out of studying scriptures and teachings from all of the world's religions. My wife and I go to St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral because I love the liturgy, the service, the mystery, the history, the music, the community. And I am a follower of the Jesus path, but not in a way that excludes any of the others. Did I make it? I'll try, to, I'll try to memorize that. That was pretty good. This is, not, this is not a question. It's just somebody writing to let you know what sure. they think. Thank you, Peter, for sharing your testimony. How important for those of us sitting in this place who are spiritual but not necessarily religious. <gasps> there is one. And, 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 <laughs> and to our clergy leadership who continue to stretch our thinking, provide support, offer a variety of opportunities to explore our spirituality in this place. Oh, thank you for that. And I, I will, yeah, you can clap for that. I will, I will share this with you too. Um, some of the most agnostic and struggling Christians I know are your senior ministers. I don't, I'm not talking about specifically yours, Reverend Judy, but I mean people who run churches who are terrified, many of them, that someone will discover that they are often filled with doubt and imposter syndrome 
and wondering how they can do it. And they just say, God, help me get on this podium again and say and give my 973rd sermon. And hopefully something real will come through, not from me, but from you. Isn't spiritual life largely a life of surrender, largely a life of getting out of the way? That's when it gets exhausting, when you think you have to be brilliant. I heard a wonderful quote of all places watching Dateline last night. I'm a true crime person, and I'm watching Dateline, and this woman whose 14-year-old daughter was killed and then is now in a position of going around and, and helping others in the community, other victims of crime. She said, and now she's a minister too in her church in Cleveland, Ohio, and she said, God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. Yeah? Let me say it again. God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. And just to have the guts to go in the direction in which you are leaning. What Joseph Campbell called following your bliss. And truly just turn the rest of it over to God. Say, so I don't have to do the perfect talk today when I come into this beautiful, esteemed event. Um, I just have to get out of the way. And, and that helps, I think, a lot of us who step up and grab microphones kind of get through the process. So I don't know if this Q&A section is over. It sounds like it is. Um, um, but but uh, let me hand the mic back to Kay. Thank you, Peter, so much. I... I don't know what part was better, the lecture or the Q&A. It was, it was just outstanding. I would like to uh, call up Reverend Hannah Ka. She's one of our pastors, if you don't know her. And uh, Reverend Hannah has a few words to say. Thank you, Peter. And this is what happens when we ready, surrender ourselves to God's call. It feels like you stirred me up with your testimony and with, with your understanding of the world, as if you're affirming everything that I struggle to put out for this church. So thank you. And when we surrender ourselves to God's call, God qualifies all of us and sings the same divine tune through all of our voices. Thank you. And I don't know if you researched about what we are doing in this church, but, oh, okay. So you sung every note that we are going to sing. And as a, first of all, I want to thank all the engagement and discipleship and other task forces that made these beautiful recommendations last year for us to carry the ministry, not only for the people who are inside the church, but also for SBNR, right? Yes. Okay. So it's a heavy duty for the pastoral team to lead our congregation while inviting ourselves to people outside the church. One of the risk steps we took was the new Bible study format perspectives where three, two out of three pastors have theological conversations about a scripture. And we use, we try not to use too heavy doctrinal language in our conversation so that we can speak easily to people outside the church. And the first episode, despite my flaws, hit more than 500 views. And... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that is to say, we are inviting, not, we are cooking this spiritual meal, not only for people outside the church, but also for those who are faithful to the church and to God and with your strong commitment to the church. So I enjoy everyone to um, take the food, spiritual food, theological food we provide and sit around the table with others and open ourselves up to have a conversation. I also think about a family gathering where I had to uh, meet the expectations of my parents, aging parents, and raising my child. And they don't have any common appetite. <laughs> so if both sides give up a little bit of their taste buds, 
and come together and have a conversation, we might all benefit from the table we prepare. So we have Perspectives, the digital uh, podcast Bible study that's only 12 to 20 minutes for everyone. And we have tapestry for you to come and have your own spiritual reflection. And we have convergence, the conversation that both seasoned people and new people can come and join and have a conversation and expand each other. And we also have racial justice movement going forward and all of that. And San Diego School of Christian Studies preparing a special one next round, right? So I took this opportunity to thank you and to thank all of our church members and friends who are here today to speak the same truth out in the world and expand what God can do through us, in us, and sometimes in spite of us. Thank you, Reverend Hannah. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I grew up very, I, I was born into a very fundamentalist Southern background, and over my lifetime, it's gotten looser and looser and looser, and I kind of think I'm in the same ballpark with you. We came together at the same time in the right age frame <laughs> somewhere. Um, so thank you all for coming. This has been a pleasure. Lunch is on the back table. Yes, sir. You have a question? Uh, is this being recorded and might we have access to it? Yes, it is being recorded and it will be on our website plus our YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, food is on the back table. Please join us, come back, have conversation with people, and enjoy yourselves for as long as you'd like. Oh, one more, one more comment. Let me just add a one quick piece in. If, if anybody would like the PowerPoints, uh, just, just email me, and I'll send it right back to you. And, and the way you do that is go to my website, peterboland.com. peterboland.com, and then there's a contact button. Hit that, say, hey, I was at the... Old Seeds, New Growth, or whatever the heck you called it. And uh, could I have the PowerPoint? I'll send that right out to you. And then secondly, um, during and after lunch, if anybody wants a book, swing on by. Thank you. <laughs> yes, if you want a book. Um, it's Peter Boland, B-O-L-L-A-N-D.com. Um, I'm, I'm always making that mistake. That's why I try to remind everybody else. So um, welcome to lunch. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you so much. Oh, my I appreciate goodness. It. We I'm came glad. to the same in, in such an opposite yeah, way. Such I mean, an opposite way. Isn't that funny? Isn't that? I, I was just thinking, oh, my God, that's.